Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to another rendition of Old vs. New. <laughs> about Hannibal Lecter and his history in movies. Great sucked, great sucked. But one film that gets overlooked at times is actually Lecter's very first appearance. This is the 1986 Michael Mann film Manhunter. And holy shit, that's not Hannibal Lecter! I thought he was a British guy with his hair slicked back. Not a British guy with his hair slicked back. Okay, there's some similarities. But that's just one of the many differences between two films based on the Thomas Harris novel, Manhunter and Red Dragon. Both are very different, but both are actually very good, too. They have their own unique style, their own way of telling a story, and their own way of showing what their characters are going through. But as always, which one holds up the strongest? Which one comes together the best? Which one toughens the nipples with delight? Well, we're gonna find out today. This is Old vs. New, Manhunter vs. Red Dragon. <laughs> The only thing better than a hero is an anti-hero, the person who constantly walks the edge of good and evil. And these are two great nuts. That sounded bad. In the role of Will Graham, we got William Peterson in Manhunter and Edward Norton in Red Dragon. Both know how to keep your attention and how to up the intensity. They both do great work. But in terms of who's better, that's a tough argument. Let's look at Norton. Norton is a very no-nonsense kind of cop. He's straightforward, hardworking, and doesn't take any bullshit. Even from one of cinema's most famous killers. I may keep them and I might consider it. No. Do you dream much, Will? Goodbye, Dr. Lecter. You haven't threatened to take away my books yet. He has a gift for sensing what a sick mind is thinking, which he sees much more as a curse rather than a blessing. But where in Red Dragon, he's a healthy guy with a dark edge. Peterson portrays him more as a sick mind that just barely made it over to the good side. And even then, it's constantly tightroping it. He doesn't seem like a well person, and deep inside he knows he could just as easily become one of those psychos he's brought in. Now don't get me wrong, they address this in Red Dragon too, but Norton still seems relatively in control. There's never a sense that he could just snap at any second. Take for example when he's trying to get into the criminal's mind. With Norton, it's very much along the lines of having an epiphany. You took your gloves off, you touched her with your bare hand, and then you wiped her down. But when the gloves were off, did you open her eyes? With Peterson, you get the feeling he's literally diving into the killer's psyche. Almost like he's sickly enjoying it. You took off your gloves to touch her, didn't you? Didn't you, you son of a bitch? You touched her with your bare hands, and then you put your gloves back on. But while your gloves were off, did you open all their eyes so that they could see you? Yeah, what you had for breakfast? Wasn't an Egg McMuffin? It was an Egg McMuffin, you fuck! Yeah! Because of this, Peterson comes across as more tortured and therefore more complex. You can see him very easily going off the deep end at any moment. Norton seems to have one foot firmly in the real world, so when Lecter makes the comparison that they're similar, it sort of sounds like your typical villain speech. Don't you understand, Well. You caught me because we are very much alike. Without our imaginations, we'd be like all those other poor dullards. In Manhunter, he literally starts freaking out, just like an unstable mind would. So it makes more sense that something like this would really get to him. Do you know how you caught me, Will? Goodbye, Dr. Lecter. You can leave messages for me at the number Do on your phone. you know file. how you caught me? The reason you caught me, Will... You're just a light. You want the scent? As much as I love Norton in this film, and he does give a solid performance, Peterson just had more of a sick, twisted mind that was more interesting to watch. Norton, you're great, but point goes to Peterson. You dirty little beast. <laughs> Let's talk about our main villain, the Tooth Fairy. Boy, wouldn't that have been a different film? Frances 
Princess Dollarhide, aka the Tooth Fairy, is portrayed by Ray Fiennes and Tom Noonan. Again, this is a very hard choice as both turned in very strong performances. Fiennes is certainly the more tragic of the two. Much more is given about his backstory and you find yourself feeling more and more sorry for him. As you watch, you get the feeling that he doesn't want to do this. But his abusive past mixed with a sick mind creates a desperate need to go through this bizarre transformation. I wish I could have trusted you. I wanted to trust you. You, you felt so good. You see more his interaction with people, how he works, how often he's in constant battle with himself. It's a great performance as well as a great character. Noonan's portrayal is a bit different. The tragedy is there, but it's more hinted at. He's left more in the shadow, which makes him come across as much more creepy as well as more unpredictable. You are privy to a great becoming and you recognize nothing. You're an ant in the afterbirth. Is your nature to do one thing correctly? Tremble. Most of his scenes don't even have music. It just lets the suspense and mystery of his actions fill the fear of the scenario. So in this case, we once again have two totally different interpretations. And it all depends on what you find stronger, the killer you have more compassion for, or the killer you're scared to death of. As much as I love both of them, I again have to go with Manhunter. Because the less you know about what's going on in his brain, the more unpredictable and therefore frightening he is. But he still has that level of depth that is needed as well. And you do see the pain he's going through, it's just not explained through words. It's explained through visuals and music. And in a film, that plays pretty strong. Tough call, but I have to side with Manhunter again. It's just another example of less is more. Point goes to the old. And you recognize nothing. <laughs> Let's get down to the one you all want to talk about, Lecter. True, he's not the main villain in either movie, and one does have him much more than the other, but I still stand by the fact that these are two very good performances and deserve to be looked at. This is the best Lecter. <laughs> now, a lot of you might be thinking this is a no-brainer. Hopkins turned this role into an icon, and whenever anybody even says the name Lecter, they immediately think of him. So obviously, he should win. But Brian Cox actually has a very different and surprisingly effective take on the role as well. He's a fast talker, he's obnoxious, he's a jerk. But he also manages to get inside your head in a matter of seconds. Thought you might be curious to see if you're smarter than the person I'm looking for. Then by implication, you think you're smarter than me since you caught me. I know that I'm not smarter than you. Then how did you catch me, Will? You had disadvantages. What disadvantages? You're insane. Hopkins is slower and more calculating. Then by implication, you think you're smarter than I am, since it was you who caught me. No, I know I'm not smarter than you. Then how did you catch me? You had disadvantages. What disadvantages? You're insane. But there's also something even more frightening about a guy who just has you pegged the minute you walk in and uses that almost immediately to start manipulating you. You came here to look at me, to get the old scent back again, didn't you? I want your opinion. I don't have one right now. Well, when you have one, I'd like to hear it. When you get more files, I'd like to see them too. You can call me when I have to call my lawyer. They'll bring me a telephone. Would you like to leave me your home phone number? Hopkins could be evil, but you never really got mad at him. This guy you just want to smack in the face half the time. But it wasn't the act that got you down, was it? Didn't you really feel so bad because killing him felt so good, and why shouldn't it feel good? What an asshole. In the book, he's used about as much as he is in Manhunter, but in Red Dragon, they upped his role because of his popularity. We mustn't judge too harshly, Will. It was his first time. Have you never felt a sudden rush of panic? <laughs> hmm? Yeah, that's the fear we talked about. On top of that, we've also had two other movies to build up the creepiness. So by the time this one rolled around, there was a lot more build-up as to what to be afraid of. We also see how he was captured in Red Dragon, which is interesting, but I'd be lying if I said I sort of didn't want to see that. Like it's better left to the imagination. And come on, how did he survive that? Next time, drop a safe on him to be sure. It's true that his age can be a little distracting in the movie, but I'm not gonna lie, the character does seem stronger when Hopkins is doing it. Now, I'm sure a lot of that has to deal with the fact that there's more time and two other movies to develop him, and on top of that, it's an Oscar-winning performance. 
but still I think it's worth noting Cox's performance as well. Yeah, it's different and there's not as much of him, but just like Michael Mann did with the other killer, there's little music, little shadow, the creepiness just comes from the performance and the blunt, harsh reality of the situation. With that said though, it's pretty hard not to love a guy who can find the real meat of a role. Point goes to the new. Smell yourself. Thomas Harris's books are always filled with colorful characters, and these characters are just as colorful... Durr. Best Supporting Cast. Again, a lot of good performances and actors to choose from. Let's start with Graham's family. In Manhunter, the wife is played by Kim Grest, and the son is played by David Simmons. In Red Dragon, it's Mary Lewis Parker and Tyler Patrick Jones. While there is a connection in Red Dragon with them, Manhunter devotes entire scenes to how this is all affecting their lives. Even a scene where he confesses to his son the hardships of a sick mind and what it means to live with it. This is a very strong moment. Barry's mom had this newspaper. It said you were in a special hospital. And then I was transferred into the psychiatric wing. And that bothers you, doesn't it? I don't know. Though, am I the only one distracted by just wanting to see the old labels for things? Oh my god, has Life and Grape Nuts ever changed their logo? The Nosy Reporter is also a lot of fun, played by a jackass Stephen Lang and a pompous Philip Seymour Hoffman. Both are great, but I think I prefer the snobby Hoffman a little bit more. That's just my personal preference, though. Jack Crawford has played well in both versions, as are the other investigators. Wait a minute, is that Barney in both of these movies? Holy shit, it is! It's like he's in two different dimensions! <laughs> but for me, the tipping point has to be with the blind woman dating the killer, played by Joan Allen and Emily Watson. And as cool as Joan Allen is, it's Watson who is far more memorable. Much more time is given to the romance between these two, and it shows in more detail how their relationship grows. Which makes it all the more tragic when you see where it all ends up. In the original, it's a little rushed. The idea is that he finally falls in love with a woman and his psychotic killer mind doesn't know how to handle it. When the attempt to kill her comes in Manhunter, it's just sort of like another kill. But in Red Dragon, it's a real hard choice, and we know why. We've seen them grow close together. The relationship with the family is important in Manhunter, but I think the relationship with her is more important in Red Dragon. It gives the character more of a purpose as well as a weight. Factoring all that in, it seems like Red Dragon truly does have the better supporting cast. Though only by a little. Point goes to the new. You know, if you don't want to talk, that's okay. Once again, it's all tied up, and it comes to the most important element, the story. Those who read the book know that Red Dragon followed it a little closer. But as we all know, that doesn't always mean it's going to make for a better movie. You could make the argument that the ending in Manhunter, though different, did at least keep the story in mostly a three-act structure. Red Dragon actually has two endings, a fake-out and then the real climax. I'll admit I'm not usually a fan of these fake-outs, but at the same time it did allow Norton a psychological confrontation with the killer as well as a physical one. In the original, he just sort of fights him off and that's it. The rest of the two stories actually follow pretty similar. The main differences are how much you see of the family, the girlfriend, and Lecter. You see more of Lecter and the girlfriend in Red Dragon, but you see more of the family interaction in Manhunter. For me personally, I prefer more Lecter and the girlfriend. Also, the story is a little bit more spelled out in Red Dragon. You can follow Manhunter okay, but a lot of stuff flies by pretty quick. For example, there's just a line in Manhunter when they say they search Lecter's cell and didn't want him to know. In Red Dragon, they actually show what they had to go through to fool him, and whether or not it works. In fact, a lot of Red Dragon is more visual. I remember much more of the creepy sets, the bizarre imagery, and the dark shadows. Now don't get me wrong, Manhunter looked good too, but when I think of it visually, I think more large beaches and a lot of blank walls. Come on guys, can't you hang a picture in there? I guess there was that weird backdrop in the killer's house, but honestly, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. All of this contributes to tell the story more fluently and providing a more natural narrative. And in terms of all that, Red Dragon does move smoother. Again, with the exception of maybe the ending, every scene seemed to fall nicely into the next. 
and the characters that needed to be focused on were constantly focused on. Even the ending isn't horrible, it just sort of seems a touch unneeded. Like, they could have had the same psychological climax at the killer's house without the family. Yeah, I know, similar to what they did in Manhunter, but maybe with a little bit more dialogue. So just to emphasize, I truly do enjoy both of these films. They're both great movies. But if I had to choose which one I like better, and I do, it would have to be Red Dragon. Though only by a tiny bit. Point goes to Red Dragon. In my opinion, the superior film. Oh, what a cunning boy you are, Will. I'm a nostalgia critic, and if you'll excuse me, I'm going to eat some liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> Hello, takeout. Yes, I would like to order your finest duck liver, please. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, sides? Yes, uh, I would like a um, side of fava beans. That would be lovely, yes. Something to drink? Let's do a Chianti. That'd be wonderful. What kind? A nice one. That'd be great. Something seems to be wrong with this. <laughs> Would you like to leave me your home phone number? <laughs>